Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Transitional Justice. And today we're going to talk to Robert Petit. Uh, and he has been involved in transitional justice, war crimes, atrocities for a lifetime, including in Cambodia and other faraway places. He has some perspective that we would really like to know about. So in a moment, we'll be back for that. Yeah, the genocide question. Um, and genocide, you know, needs to be defined, of course. Robert, you're a lawyer, and you've been dealing in this question and other related questions for decades and lifetimes. And I wonder if you could help us right out of the box on what is genocide. Genocide is a legal concept that has come to embody in the public consciousness uh, the worst expression uh of outrage at uh, the worst of humanity. Uh, and uh, that's what I wanted to, to bring across today is that even though people have been believed that they've been victimized and they've been victims of genocide, uh, that societies believe it, that you know the general public, uh, it's a first and foremost a legal concept. And if you want to be able to achieve the promised result, uh, results of, of, of accountability for genocide. I think it's important, and it's my experience, that you have to manage the expectations of people and make them understand that their victimization is real, was real. Uh, it's not denied, but in terms of a legal concept, it has to fit within certain criteria. Um, is it a question of intention? I mean, can you have the intention of committing genocide but uh, but um, not the fact. In other words, you don't achieve your t intention. Um, or do you have to have both to make a case for genocide? No. And actually, uh, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which is a 1948 convention, uh, in its definitions, uh, in its in its in its statute, uh, does include uh, committing and attempting to commit. So even if you don't succeed, you can and will be prosecuted uh, or could be prosecuted for genocide. And, and um, uh, what, what is, um, you know, genocide in terms of the intention or the fact? Uh, in other words, uh, if I want to spirit children away into Siberia and change the way they think uh, in order to disrupt the culture of Ukraine, um, the people of Ukraine, the families of Ukraine, the society. Is that genocide? Well, the, the best refuge of a lawyer is always the, 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 the law, right? So let me read you the Article 2 of the Convention, uh, of the Convention, as I said, on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. It says, in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. And the four, the, the five ways are killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and finally, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Oh. So your answer is, your answer is if you prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, or whatever, level of uh, evidence uh, threshold is, is in that court, uh, that you did indeed uh, having the intent, don't forget, it's a special intent, the intent to destroy in whole or in part that religious, that group in question as such because of that group exists and forcibly transferring children, then you will be found guilty. So that raises an interesting question because you're not talking about one case, not one atrocity, not one example of torture. Uh, not one, um, you know, single case, single victim. You're talking about a people, a culture, a large number of people. So to prove a case of genocide, you have to look at the whole group. And one witness about one atrocity is not enough. How do you, how big does the group have to be? How do you establish it, that? It sounds very difficult. It is. It is an extremely difficult uh, uh, charge to prove, but not necessarily because of that group issue, although I want to talk about that. It is because of that specific intent. Now, in most, case, most criminal cases, all criminal cases, uh, 
You have to prove that the person intended the consequence of its actions and did commit those actions. In this particular case, you have to prove not only, for example, that the person killed members of the group, but intended to kill them because they were a member of that group. So it's a double intent. It's one of the rare crimes, actually, as far as I know, it's the only one, that has this special intent, a double intent. Uh, well, and like a hate crime in the US, isn't it? Well, it, it has to be based- that you murder the person, but you murder the person because that person had a certain profile in a group was a member of a group. But the issue in terms of the genocide, in terms of genocide, sorry, is that you can only be found guilty if you committed one of those five acts that are enumerated against members of four specific groups. So a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. If you, for example, as was the case in Cambodia, if most, the vast majority of victims, and we're talking about 1.2 million people, almost 25% of the population killed over four years. The vast majority of these people were not victims of genocide. They were stabbed, they were starved to death, they were worked to death, they were tortured to death. They were all killed, but they were not, vic most of them were not victims of genocide because the Khmer Rouge, their intent was to basically re-engineer Khmer society from the ground up. They wanted to create this agrarian utopia. And if you were not part of that, you know, ideal agrarian culture or, or, or society, sorry, and or were thought not to be able to be changed and, 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 and adapt to it, then you were an enemy, a political enemy, and you were killed, you were smashed. Because not because you were a member of a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group, but because you were a member of a political group the bourgeoisie, those who could not become part of this agrarian utopia. And as, so one of the hardest things I've had to do in Cambodia, despite the whole culture, the whole country is convinced and people, the survivors, were convinced that a genocide happened in Cambodia. And if you look up Cambodia or, or, or what happened in, you know, genocide in Cambodia in Wikipedia, you'll, be, you'll see the genocide in Cambodia or Cambodia genocide or whatever. Uh, but one of the hardest thing I had to do was to tell these people that yes, your family were victimized, you were victimized, thousands, millions died, but most of them were not victims of genocide and I'm not going to prosecute people for genocide in these cases because it's a legal concept that the drafters of the convention, and I wanna make this clear, the drafters of the convention in 1948 purposely chose not to include political as a class to be protected, as a group to be protected, and that's the intent. That convention protects those groups in a way, because not only does it seek the punishment of the crime of genocide, but it forces all 152 signatories to the convention to prevent genocide. So there is a duty. And that's why, for example, if you remember <clears throat> when Colin Powell said there were genocide, a genocide in Sudan, that has a legal meaning. That qualification triggers an obligation on the US, who became a member of it you know, a signatory of the convention 1988. So, you know, only 40 years later to decide to prevent <laughs> genocide. Uh, but uh, uh, that, that phrase triggers an obligation, according to the convention, to prevent and eventually punish genocide. So the drafters in 1948, as I said, purposely chose those four categories to be protected. And in Cambodia, that was a main issue. Couple of questions about all of that. What what did you prosecute them for, and what is the distinction of the way you cast it as a prosecution in Cambodia with the way it would have been had you prosecuted it, had you been able to prosecute it as a genocide? There were actually two charges of genocides that were laid against two individuals. Uh, you must remember that we had five uh, five accused uh, because this was 25 years, 30 years after the crimes. Uh, the youngest was 70, I think, or 70 something. Uh, and the oldest uh, died at 95, I think. Uh, so those were the most senior members of the Khmer Rouge that we could prosecute at the time. Uh, and they were eventually two of them found guilty of genocide, but guilty of genocide against the Vietnamese or you know, a group of Vietnamese uh, who were in Cambodia and Chams who were ethnic Cambodians, but who were Muslims and who were killed because they were Muslims, because, you know, religion, if, re religion was abolished under the Khmer Rouge, but Muslim, Islam, sorry, was 
was perceived as being particularly an, an enemy of the reform that they were seeking. And Vietnamese were an ancestral you know, uh, enemy uh, of, the Cam- of the Khmer. So those two populations were killed uh, and two individuals, one was found guilty of the genocide, having committed genocide against the Vietnamese and the other individual, Nun Chea, the number two in the regime uh, at the time, was found guilty of both, uh, having committed genocide against both groups. So we did manage. But don't forget, Genocide is a legal term, a legal convention, uh, but these crimes, these mass crimes are also punishable as crimes against humanity. Uh, And generally speaking, uh, if you have elements of genocide, if you feel confident enough that you have a case for genocide, you have a case for crimes against humanity as well. And those charges are laid side by side, and then the judge decides which ones are proven. So you prosecuted the ones that could not be legally treated as genocide as crimes against humanity you charge both you charge both because uh, crimes against humanity you need to prove a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population and the commission of a, a bunch of underlying crimes murders rapes etc cetera, etc cetera. so generally the fact patterns match right there is a mass violence committed against groups of unarmed or defenseless people now the intent can vary and in some cases during the course of that commission, there's different locations, different individuals, different events that could be qualified as genocide. Look, for example, at Srebrenica, what happened in Bosnia, in Srebrenica. There was a conflict there in former Yugoslavia, but only one case in Srebrenica, where 7,000 Muslims, men and boys were killed, uh, was found to be uh, genocide. Uh, so the fact patterns generally lend themselves to charges of both crimes against humanity and genocide. And then it's up to you, as I said, to present the best case and the judge to decide. How about the decision on sentencing, on punishment? Is it the same or different? And who decides? Uh, the judges decide, depending on the court, obviously. But uh, And that's why I meant, that's why I said earlier, a measure of justice and how it's important to, to have that in mind. How how can you talk about justice, right, when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of innocent people killed, uh, for example, in Rwanda in 90 days, about 500,000 killed by their neighbors or their family members even, or their, you know, uh, carers. And or, or How can you talk about justice? Or the Holocaust. Or the Holocaust. Well, uh, actually, uh, genocide, I don't know if, uh, if I can, genocide comes from the Holocaust, right? Genocide, the word genocide was created in 1944 by a Polish Jew named Raphael Lemkin, who was an idol of mine, who, not because he was a prosecutor, uh, but because uh, in his book, uh, Axis Rule in 1944, examining what the Nazis were doing under their rule, uh, decided and, and advocated uh, and kept advocating for the rest of, the, of his life that a crime such as this one, where you want to exterminate members of a group simply because they are a member of that group, that should be specifically recognized. And he coined the term genocide. Uh, and then managed to convince the allies and then and, and, and yeah the allies at the time and the United Nations to to enshrine it into a convention in 1948, uh, which as I say now 152 countries have, have have signed on to. But it was 40 years before the first conviction of genocide happened, and that was in the Rwandan context. In 1998, uh, Akayezu was found guilty of genocide. And as you, as as we've mentioned, how I mean, and the sentence was life, life imprisonment. But you are always talking about a measure of justice, and when you're talking about victimization on any scale, even when I was a prosecutor, it's one of the uh, national prosecutor in Montreal. The first lesson you learn is that, again, you need to do your job uh, as best as you can, and then hopefully this will help heal the person, or in this case, the nation. But it's it's a small part of it, and it's a certain measure of justice. Well, I, I say, yeah, when, when you use the term measure of justice, it's euphemistic in, in the sense that it's not exactly what a prosecutor would want or feel is appropriate, and it's not exactly what the world would want or feel is appropriate. It's often less than that. How can you punish one individual for the death of six million? Or in the case of the uh, Rwanda, you know, five, was it five? Thousand per day, five hundred thousand. Uh, the numbers vary, but uh, most people agree on five hundred thousand for the ninety days. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, I mean, that's, you know, it's hard to imagine an appropriate punishment where they're dead um, and died horribly, and he's still alive with the poss possibility of, you know, having a life, getting out of jail even. And so, um, you know, it's hard to feel that the measure is, what do I want to call it, biblical, um, because it never is quite biblical, is it? Well, uh, leaving the religious notion aside, uh, well, actually, no, you know what, I'll come back to that, because it, it, okay, it's, it's right to say nothing is perfect. But as I said, what you're doing, it's like your national system in the U.S. or mine in Canada, right? It plays a part in the society and how it wants to define itself. And hopefully in transitional justice, it is helping rebuild that society towards something better that will certainly prevent it from happening again. That's your hope. Now, of course you can believe that there will be also measure, other measures of justice in the other world. But what I found interesting, you have to be, you, you have to keep in mind again, the humility of what you're doing and the limit uh, of it. And I found interesting in Cambodia, uh, it was very interesting from the very beginning. We talked to survivors at the beginning of, of Tol Sling, S21, which was the, the center, the torture center, where about 20,000 people were, 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 were tortured and, and killed. Uh, and there were seven survivors, I think, at the time. And mm -hmm. we talked to some of them. And from the beginning, most of them, and actually most Khmer of that who lived through that period, were not seeking retributive justice. We're not wanting these individuals that we're prosecuting. Well, not, nothing to them directly because they were far remote, most of them except for one, Doik maybe. Uh, they wanted and they would have been satisfied with an apology, a contrite, sincere apology. And that, from my understanding, and I, I may be wrong, but that flowed from the Buddhist belief uh, of, of atoning uh, and how that is sufficient. That equals justice. It's not the same in other cultures. It's not the same in other eras. It's not the same in other circumstances. But there has to be accountability. It can't be perfect because nothing is, but there has to be accountability if you want to hope for better. So well, account accountability sounds like punishment to me. And so, um, you know, I, I, let, me, let me just give you the, the four corners of my thinking on it and see what you say. Um, 40 years is a long time. Um, a lot of these really horrendous crimes, um, you know, took a long time. And we talked about that before the show and how long it takes to do a proper job as the prosecutor of war crimes and genocide and the like. Um, one of the purposes of punishment is, um, you know, to punish. Uh, another purpose is to deter others from doing it also. And in the time that you have practiced, in the time since Cambodia, in the time since Holocaust, the Holocaust, um, you know, one, one wonders whether the steps that have been taken, the measures that have been meted out, actually deterred others from likewise committing genocide and war crimes. And you could make the case that justice delayed is justice denied. You could make the case that that you're not going to deter anybody until you actually come to a bottom line punishment. Um, what do you say to that? Well, I'm sure I understand what bottom line punishment you're referring to, but um, I, I, again, it's the same as having, as far as I know, there is no culture, no country certainly that doesn't have a system of justice as part of its society, right? It serves a purpose. Um, it's not perfect. There's a, you know, it, but it serves a purpose. And among other things, like I said, it helps define what society, what that society is, and what it hopes to achieve. Right? Uh, it's the same with mass crimes. I agree with you, and you know, I think most prosecutors would agree that it's it's the, the element of deterrence is is you are contributing to that element of deterrence, but only again as part of a larger picture. Right? It starts with your parent teaching you not to steal something. Right, and then it ends up maybe with the police officer arresting you for stealing. There's a whole, you know, there's a whole gamut there that goes in the, what happens. And so again, that system of justice is only part of the answer. But what I found, I think, what is important, I think, especially in international criminal law and and the prosecution of mass atrocities, is that generally speaking, the the, the priority generally uh, is to go against the architects of these conflicts. And you know why? 
because you will always find somebody to wield a machete or pull the trigger. Mm. There's there, there there will always be some. But somebody who has the wherewithals to design something like this and to make it happen, those are few and far between. And being able to show that there will be accountability for that type of people, I believe, has some uh, some impact, as some you know, and is certainly worthwhile to to try and pursue. Doesn't mean that again the small fishers need to get away. No, not at all. And interest, you know, uh, interesting again. An example in Rwanda, where hundreds of thousands of small fishes, as I said, were judged by their own peers in 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 informal courts, uh, sitting on the grass, literally, which is the gachacha uh, concept, which is literally means sitting on the grass. Um, everybody has to account for their actions, but if you're going to try and uh, and contribute to the prevention of such mass atrocities, then I think prosecuting those most responsible is certainly uh, important and can help. You know, it's, it's like uh, we have to keep up with it. There's more people in the world. Seems like there's been a lot of mass atrocities or call it just mass crimes. You know, the American insurrection, January 6th, that was a mass crime. Um, the, um, you know, the, the protest in uh, Brasilia uh, two weeks ago, that was also a mass crime. It's not a genocide, certainly it's not human rights, uh, but it's a mass crime and you have to deal with it. And your system of justice has to be able to reach it and, and provide, um, you know, the, the deterrence so that it doesn't happen again and again. And I suggest to you that in our world, the, the world in which you and I have lived for the past several you know, decades, um, the number of mass crimes has gone up. And so we need a system that will hopefully deter this going forward. So I ask you this question, Robert, as a prosecutor who has spent his life in dedication to dealing with mass crimes, mass crimes against nature, against human rights and atrocities, um, what would you do to improve, to change the system, to make it more effective, to make it more likely to deter future expressions of mass crime, mass atrocities? Well, mass crimes in my in my field, mass crimes is defined by the number of victims and not the number of participants. Uh, so I would differ on your your take on on both the January sixth and Brasilia. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, from the, again, I might be wrong, but from what I've read, uh, and if you look back historically on the last two thousand years, uh, we live actually in an era that's probably the safest and less violent. Uh, than the human experience has ever has ever been through. What has changed, obviously, is the means, which are you know, which have which have given uh, even a single individuals a lot more uh, power to to to, to commit uh, atrocities, uh, and we have the information uh, of it that is much, that is so widespread and that is so you know omnivalent. Uh, that's not a word, but. Uh, it's 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 what we know about what's being committed, not necessarily what's. You know. So, human experience is a work in progress, right? Um, and I think the context will always be uh, a political. Will always de depend on the will of the people, making sure that their leaders, you know, abide by it. Uh, I think all of us want to live in peace. All of us want to have a future and and one for our children. Uh, and certainly, I think. Hopefully, even though maybe the last 10 years or so have been a little bit a dip uh, in, the, in that wave, uh, I think it is still uh, progressing towards a better world and towards more accountability for these types of crimes. If that's the case, then yeah, we have a hope of, uh, of, of deterring uh, and eventually, you know, again, leaving a better world for our kids. Mm, yeah, well, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, you know, we have, we have a... A, a, a daily uh, news thread that reports on the emergence of autocracies around the world. Uh, and I suppose you could say, I'm interested in your thought on this, so that uh, autocracies are more likely to, to do mass crimes, atrocities. Um, at, the, at the same time, um, you know, I, I, this leads to the, 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 the proposition that a person who is a prosecutor of atrocities may be able to predict where and when they are more likely to happen looking forward. Is it true to you? Do you think along those lines, gee whiz, we have an autocracy. 
gee whiz, uh, you know, the batons and the gas are coming out and they're changing rubber bullets to real ones. And before you know it, there are people dead in the street, what have you. Um, and, and there's no control over the people who uh, have the force and um, there's no control over their violence. Um, can't you predict, uh, do you predict, de facto, do you predict in your perception of the way the world works where uh, atrocities are more likely to happen or less? Uh, Germany, 1930s, was a democracy, right? Um, uh, but there is uh, there is actually a recipe for genocide. There are seven elements which needs to happen uh, for genocide to to be uh, to, to to happen. No country is immune. No, uh, I I know that because I've worked in all kinds of different countries where these things have happened. No country, no political system is immune. But obviously, autocracies need violence uh, and need an enemy. Uh, to to use to stay in power, uh, they need both of these things. So obviously, once you are once you've reached that point, once from if you started a democracy, once you've reached that point, you are obviously very much closer to uh, to mass atrocities being uh, being likely. So you mentioned before that this convention, uh, nineteen forty eight, I think it was about genocide. It took the U.S. forty years to get around to it. Which is, it's, you know, that's like the Kyoto uh, Climate Change <laughs> Convention, the same thing. It takes us a while. Um, it, it, it has a trigger mechanism. And if, uh, for example, you, you find that genocide taking place in a given country or society, um, that it triggers some kind of obligation on the part of the members to the convention. What, what does it trigger? What are they supposed to do? And has that been successful? Do they do what they're supposed to do? Well, again, uh, you know, it's like a marriage contract. You, 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 you. If you can sign it, it uh, doesn't mean you're going to be faithful. It uh, doesn't mean you, you know. Uh, so, and and if you see some of the some of the worst regimes in history, have had the the most brilliant uh, human rights oriented constitutions uh, on paper. Uh, so it is worth uh, it is worth what the political will to enforce it is worth, uh, and uh, indeed, uh, it does trigger an obligation on the on the contracting parties to 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 prevent and to punish. Um, but you are talking about a political decision, uh, which means, do I, for example, intervene in another country uh, with my armed forces to stop a genocide happening? Uh, we've seen. Uh, we are seeing in Syria uh, the lack of, of, of or, or, a, 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 a tragic lack of, of, of cohesion and intervention uh, to prevent uh, what has happened in, in Syria and in other countries. Um, so it's always ultimately about, as I said, the leaders making the decisions that they think their people will either accept or ignore or, uh, or want. Uh, and, uh, acting on their obligations. But, you know, 152 countries is not the whole world. Uh, so there's a lot of countries who have not, who have chosen not to uh, sign on to this convention for whatever reason. Does not mean that they are either going to commit or won't stop uh, a genocide. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's still a very important first step that they've decided not to take. Yeah, it's a, it's a moral statement. And uh, making the moral statement has its own deterrent effect, doesn't it? Yeah. Of course, and what, that's what the law is, right? It is an expression of who you are as a society. It's what you you don't you you what you 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 prevent, what you punish, what you accept, uh, and it helps defines who you are. So, if we're talking about the polit you know, an international political system, uh, certainly conventions to which your partner uh, help you define what you think uh, you are. Well, you've you've been everywhere and done everything. I. I uh... I'm very impressed and uh, um, awe-inspired um, by uh, your career. And I have a couple of questions I want to ask you about that. I mean, so we have, we have um, Sudan and uh, the Congo. We have Rwanda. And to some extent, Rwanda is still not a very safe place. Um, we, we have, uh, well, I, I, I've talked to people who won't, won't go back there, feel that they're in jeopardy. Not oh, 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 that's in that sense, in that sense, in that sense, there are, okay, sorry, yes, yeah, yeah. go ahead. 
And then, then, you know, Latin America, Latin America was never stable uh, since the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and uh, it isn't, certainly it isn't stable now. It could be, uh, that it, you know, from an aspirational point of view, you hope that someday soon it will be, but it isn't all that stable. A democracy defined different ways and it lasts for different periods of time. So we have hotspots, and you mentioned the Middle East, of course, dangerous place. And, and the Rohingya, uh, you know, in Southeast Asia, these are horrible things. Um, mm-hmm. But it seems to me uh, that right now, uh, Ukraine is at the top of the priority, simply because of the, the, the number of the relentless killing of civilians. And I, and I wonder where that fits, because there's so much going on, and somebody like you would follow it everywhere. And uh, I don't know if you lose sleep over it, but we collectively, the human race, we should le- be losing sleep over this. This should not be happening, and yet uh, it is happening. And, and uh, you know, here on Think Tech, we always ask the question, what can I do? What should I do? Everyone has to do something. Uh, do we all have to be a Robert Petit? Uh, do we all have to study law and uh, genocide and go to various distant places in the universe and participate in a process that will deter further genocide? What can we do? Um, what do you What do you suggest to somebody who's young and idealistic? I would suggest help build your own society to be one where human rights are respected and a priority for their own citizens. Uh, and that will reflect in its foreign policy and that will have an influence there for worldwide. It starts at home. It starts with building countries that do respect, not only respect, but honor uh, human rights for themselves uh, and then for others as a right, but as also an obligation. Uh, it starts at home. You don't need to go abroad. Uh, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to do anything but make sure that around you and your society itself is an example of what human race can be. And then hopefully that's how you build, as I said, an ecosystem where this is a, a principle. Mm. You know, they say, I don't, I'm not sure it's true anymore, but they used to say, all oh, politics is local. All human rights is local, too. All decency is local. <laughs> yeah. I agree. So um, uh, where, where, where does this go? How do you see your career unfolding? How do you see the obligations of somebody in your position, your experience, your uh, expertise? Uh, where, does, where does it go for you? Is this a lifelong mission that will never stop for you? I've always I've always said that after being a parent, uh, this is the greatest privilege I've, I've had of uh, being able to to bring some justice to to crimes uh, victims and 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 help you know heal them and society now with uh, with this type of work. So you know I've retired, for example, from the OJ, but I'm still in the in the mix in in other in other functions. And yeah, as long as I can, I think I will. And I, as I said, to me, it's a privilege. It's not an obligation. We all ought to do something, and uh, I envy you the privilege that you have and appreciate. Query one other thing: is it seems to me, although you know politics and and human rights is local in many ways, what about the United Nations? Um, the United Nations has um, certain impediments, if you will, because of the Security Council rules. Uh, you know where China violates human rights on a regular basis, and certainly Russia does. Um, and they have the right of veto. So the, the question is, um, what do we need in the way of an international organization? Uh, I understand this relationship, but it's not a direct relationship between the UN and the International Court of Criminal Justice. Um, but what can we do uh, to have an international organization that is unimpeded? Well, if you look at the history of the United Nations, I mean, it came out obviously of conflict, and it it was professing to help build a better world uh, with with certain ideals. And I think for all its its you know for all its 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 weaknesses, I think the United Nations is still a central part of this rules based world order that needs to be you know to be sometimes built, sometimes rebuilt, sometimes upheld. Um, 
but certainly I think the United Nations is a central part of this. Um, and if it wasn't for it, uh, you know, if you don't have a forum where you can debate things, then you resort to violence. Uh, or if you have nowhere to put the glare uh, on, on what you're doing, uh, then you can get away with it. Um, so the United Nations, I think, is an important part of this. But again, it comes down to uh, the, 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 the willingness of its members. The United Nations doesn't exist out, out of thin air. It's, it's, it's the, it, it is the expression of, the, of those who are members of it and those who control it. So if the political will is there to make it work and to have it have a, as a profound impact as it can have, which I think it does, uh, then uh, it's up to them. But as we've seen over you know, the last decades, uh, there's been changes uh, in, in the political orders of, uh, of the world. And uh, it's reflected in the, the trials and tribulations of the UN. But it is an essential part. You know, every, every forum that you can talk instead of fight it's 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 hopeful. Yeah, and it makes moral statements. Um, you know, uh, Antonio Guterres can make a statement, sort of like Joe Biden can make a presidential proclamation. It, he may not be able to get Congress to go along with him, but he can make a statement, and that's leadership. So, so the Secretary General can also engage in leadership, and that's really mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. What about the organizations like Project Expedite Justice? Where do they fit in all of this? Um, what, you know, your role, uh, exactly what it is, what is it and why? Um, what do you think their, their future in this particular area of human activity is? Well, I'm, I'm advising on a, on a Ukraine, on the project that they have in Ukraine. Uh, and Project Expedite Justice as, uh, you know, uh, as others, as hundreds of thousands of others, uh, NGOs of different sizes and different focus. Uh, but in this particular field, and I've seen them evolve from you know, since 90, I guess since the 90s, they can have a tremendous impact uh, locally on whatever they focus on locally or uh, nationally or even internationally. Uh, for example, the court in Sierra Leone where I worked, uh, the tribunal, uh, would never have been created if it wasn't for an organization called No Peace Without Justice um, that basically pushed and pushed to have some kind of relief for the crimes that had been committed during the Civil War. Project Expedite Justice has devoted its as a mandate where it devotes itself to uh, helping uh, to bring accountability uh, and empowering victims. And uh, it, as well as any other organization that, that has that mandate, again, it's a brick in the wall. It helps build you know this 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 society uh this rules-based world order that we would all wish to live in um and it has an essential role in it if we want a world order like that we have to contribute in some way to help it yeah, whatever way what, that may be yeah and that's exactly well, what they do thank you robert that's very nice to talk to you there are many other subjects and questions i would like to ask you about but we're out of time uh, Robert Petit from Ottawa, thank you so much for your work, your service in humanity, uh, and for this discussion. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate uh -huh. it. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.